Paul euh... So let me start again, essentially where we stopped yesterday. Uh, this is just, I, I'm going to carry on discussing E plus E minus collisions. Uh, so this is just a very brief reminder of the main equations I'm still going to need for any sort of reason in the next couple of minutes. Uh, so remember, just to put things in perspective, we're computing E plus E minus collisions going to QCD kind of final state. So in this case, a quark anti quark pair is the simplest thing you can get. And we're interested in having an extra gluon either emitted from the quark or the anti quark line, or not forgetting that in many cases you also need, for, for example, for inclusive observables, you also need virtual corrections if you want to get a finite result at the end of the day. Uh, so we obtained yesterday, or well, I gave you yesterday the amplitude for this process, the square root of the amplitude for this process, and after integrating over any possible orientation of the QQ bar gluon plane, you essentially get a differential cross section where x1 and x2 are essentially the energies, the energy fractions of the quark and anti quark. Uh, you can also define an energy fraction for, uh, well, the energy fractions defined this way, knowing that because of energy conservation, uh, the sum of the x's is, is just two, so only two of these three variables are actually independent. So is there any question on what I said yesterday before I add some new stuff? Good. Uh, so there were a few things yesterday that I completely forgot to mention and uh, some of you asked me questions about that, so let me clear this immediately. Uh, with my apologies for forgetting to say it yesterday. First of all, I didn't say it from the beginning, but I'm actually working with massless quarks, uh, in case this was not obvious. If you start including masses to the outgoing quarks, you'll get corrections due to the mass in here. So just by looking at this expression, you can probably guess that this is, uh, that this is massless. But so I'm essentially just going to neglect quark masses. Uh, I'm probably not going to talk about top quark uh, in these lectures, and I'm not neglecting the mass of the top quark, uh, but I'm not going to speak about it, so that's good luck. Uh, I'm probably just going to briefly mention quarks in passing in a few places where, where this might be relevant, uh, but, but besides that, I'm just working, assuming it's the, high, the, the energy is high enough so that we can neglect uh, the masses of the quarks. Uh, one thing also that we said yesterday is that the, the real and virtual graphs, uh, we saw that if you compute the inclusive cross sections for E plus and minus going to QCD final state, uh, the UV divergence cancel according to the uh, uh, Block Norsic or Kinoshita Lindauenberg theorems. Uh, I said that you also have UV divergences, and these UV divergences actually get renormalized. Uh, the practical effect of this renormalization is at the end of the day, the alpha s that I'm writing in all these, uh, in all these expressions actually becomes, instead of being the bare unnormalized running coupling, sorry, the bare unnormalized coupling of the, uh, the bare Lagrangian, becomes just the renormalized coupling of the renormalized Lagrangian. So whenever I write alpha s here, you should think about this as alpha s of the real physical alpha s scale, which in this case means alpha s needs to get a scale and there's a typical scale in this process, which is, uh, well, in principle, it's alpha s of some scale. And in this case, I can take this scale to be uh, square root of s. There's essentially only one hard scale in the problem here, which is, which is the center of mass energy. Uh, this can fluctuate up and down by some constant factor, typically. Uh, or this can be taken, you can take square root of s over 2 or 2 square root of s. No one is going to blame you for that. Uh, at this order of the perturbation theory, it just doesn't matter which scale I'm choosing. Because any correction to alpha s, if I choose a different scale here, say q prime instead of q, the difference between alpha s of q prime and alpha s of q is of order alpha s squared, which goes beyond my accuracy at this order of the perturbation theory. So if I was to calculate the higher order corrections to this, so imagine e plus e minus going to hadrons at alpha s squared, then indeed the choice of scale I'm making here for the first term is going to have some form of impact on the second term. But at least for this matter, 
for all that I'm saying here, is just sufficient to say that the, the running coupling is actually the renormalized one, and I'm just taking it at some scale, which is in this case square root of s. Uh, feel free to vary the factor up to up and down if you want to get some, for example, some uh, renormalization scale uncertainty in your results. Is that okay for everyone? Good. So I'm, I'm essentially going to pick up where I left yesterday, which is we're starting to discuss how it is possible to try and characterize the final state of a collision, uh, essentially trying to measure something more than just an inclusive e plus e minus to hadron's cross-section. Uh, so the example I gave you yesterday was the example of thrust, uh, and I didn't... So we, disc we were discussing thrusts yesterday when we... Uh, finish these lectures uh, with, I, I can, I didn't write down the, the, the equations again, but essentially the idea is that you build an observable which is sensitive to how collimated the final state is going to be. So if you have an event like this, you're going to get thrusts close to one. If you have an event like this, you're going to get thrusts uh, smaller than one, in this case it's probably going to be something about two-thirds, and if you start having an event which is completely symmetric with particles in all directions, this is actually going to go to thrusts uh, roughly equal to one-half, uh, may depend on the dimensions of your event, if you make it flat or if you make it a sphere. Uh, so maybe this is for sphere or for planar. I'll let you do the calculation. Uh, so essentially the idea behind this is trying to understand whether one, several things. One, whether QCD tends to produce final state like this or like that, that that's one thing. Uh, two, also by measuring the thrust distribution, so by measuring s some function of T instead of just one number which is E plus E minus going to anything, any hadron kind of thing, uh, you actually get something which is, you get more information than in a function than in one number, and so this is something you can use, for example, to test, uh, to test QCD and to test, well, in the old days, it's something you can use to test whether QCD is or is not a good theory for strong interactions if you're able, or if you're not able, to reproduce with basic QCD calculations what is measured in E plus E minus collisions. So, Without even looking at the results we had yesterday for the thrust distribution at order alpha s, would you expect QCD events to be more like this or more like this? So more, so who's for more collimated? Who's for more spherical? Okay, good. Question is why? Ah, yes. Yeah. So we've seen that the the main places, so the, the these amplitude here, so this this process here, as essentially these these divergences here, these divergences come essentially either from soft gluon emission. If you have, if if I start adding soft gluons here and there. They're soft, they really, they don't really matter much in terms of how the energy is spread in my event. It's just soft stuff that I add here and there. Uh, they might ma start matter at some point, but for the basic picture, they do not too much. Uh, or this one minus x starts blowing up when particles become cleaner. So when I start branching guys either along the direction of the quark or along the direction of the anti-quark. So only in very much rarer case when I have something which, uh, instead of hitting these, these divergences, these contributions, these parts of the phase space which are enhanced by, uh, by these extra factors, there's the rest of the phase space, which is typically something where this kinematic factor is just finite and you just pick up essentially a finite alpha s correction. In some finite alpha s correction, I'm going to have a situation like this one where, in, well, maybe not exactly this one, but something intermediate, where I do have something which is not exactly quali quali well, where something I cannot really quantify as soft, which starts distorting my uh, real 
two main direction kind of picture. And, and, but this kind of effect is much rarer because it's not enhanced by any, uh, by any extra kinematic factor in the amplitude or in the, uh, or in the cross section. Okay? So, this is already something important because it's, tells, it's telling you that you should, expe you should expect a distribution of thrust which is peaked close to, uh, close to thrust equals one. Uh, it also tells you a few things. For example, uh, that you should expect really events where the main, well, when, where the particles are essentially well described by just, well, where the particles are actually produced along a few, uh, starting from two directions, two main directions, maybe three directions or four directions if you've, by luck, had an extra one or two hard gluon emissions. So, uh, before getting into the next set of uh, final state objects I'd like to discuss, uh, just one thing in passing, thrust is actually still partially used today. Can, can anyone give me one example in which uh, lab measurement of thrust distribution are still used uh, today? So the idea is fairly simple. Lab measures thrust. You have a bunch of experimentalists measuring this d sigma dt uh, distribution from lab data, 20 years old, uh, maybe even more. And on the other hand, you have a bunch of theorists trying to do their best to calculate d sigma dt with their best possible accuracy. What can you use that for? Yes. Measuring alpha s. So this is still one of the most precise me ways to measure alpha s. And if you open the PDG, somewhere in the 20-ish uh, order of 20 ways there are to extract alpha s from either data or latest lattice QCD simulations, uh, thrust is one of those guys. Uh, including, as well as thrust, other E plus and minus event shapes that I will not discuss, things like sphericity. Uh, once you've discussed thrust, which is essentially measuring things in the direction of what people call the thrust axis, so that direction you use in thrust that essentially maximizes the thrust, this is called the thrust axis. Once you measure thrust, you can actually start measuring uh, what's left. So anything which goes in the plane perpendicular to the thrust axis, that's what we call thrust major. And once you have thrust and thrust major, there's still one direction which is left, which is orthogonal to the thrust axis and the thrust major axis, which is called thrust minor. Uh, so there's, there's lots of different event shapes that people have considered over uh, over the years, that once measured uh, can be used to try and extract uh, the value of alpha s with more or less success. But still, I mean, it's, it's in the particle data book, which means that uh, it's something that has reached a certain precision both in terms of the data and in terms of uh, the QCD calculations. So the state of the art now is actually beyond uh, what I just did in a, in a Blackboard lecture. So, the last set of things, well, there's, there's one set of observables I'd like to discuss, and then going back and finish the C plus and minus part with, with a few generic, more generic observations that might be helpful for the future. One is discuss, so one is discussing other kind of observables, and so in terms of other kinds of observables, it's, it's actually an introduction to something I'm going to come back to in the had full hadronic collisions or proton-proton collisions, it's something called jets. And who here has never heard of jets? Okay, good. So, the There's essentially two things behind, behind this. One is, is just a conceptual picture, and one is how do you turn this conceptual picture into uh, something well-defined. So the conceptual picture is essentially the one I just uh, highlighted now. If you look at an event, 
you expect most of the particles in the event, most of the energy flow in the event, to actually go in s alongside a few directions in, in the event. So if, if now I'm looking at an event which is something like this, or if I'm looking at an event where the particles look something like that, you're probably, I'm telling you, this is E plus E minus collision, this is the final state of an E plus E minus collision, you're probably going to tell me, well, in the first case, uh, the color, okay, oh, great. You're probably going to tell me, well, this is E plus E minus, so the first thing that E plus E minus does is going to QQ bar. Uh, remember, it's QCD, I don't care about muons. Uh, so there's, you're essentially going to tell me, fine, this was actually my initial quark and anti-quark, all right? Uh, what happens in this case? What's your first gut feeling here? Quark and the quark gluon. I don't know exactly in which, in which order. Anyone can be the quark, anyone. The, which one is the gluon is a much more delicate question. But essentially, you're going to say this is, this is one of those rare cases, or rarer cases, where actually my QQ bar pair has radiated the hard gluon. Okay? And then the rest is mostly some Kinear stuff. Or extra possible uh, soft particles here and there, which I haven't... Uh, care growing. All right? So the, the, the idea behind JETS is really trying from the event to identify these bunches of particles. So the, this is something which is used over and over again exactly for that reason. The, the, the very basic principle is whenever you have a hard part and somewhere in your, your basic underlying process, you do expect to have a jet out of it. So that hard part on is going to radiate some collinear stuff, soft stuff everywhere, which I don't care about, but it's going to radiate essentially to branch collinearly using this, this collinear divergence. At the end of the day, you will not see just one part, and you will see a bunch of particles in, in the, but these particles are essentially in the direction of the original part that I had created. Uh, so the, 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 really the basic principle is, so there's, there's probably two uh, in this context. The basic observer, observation is particles flow in a handful of direction. There's just a, a few directions in which these particles tend to, tend to flow in the final state. And these directions are, my, are the, the initial hard partons. So in, in, in that context, <clears throat> in, in that context, really the, the, the operative, the rule of thumb really the basic concept is this. At the end of the day, you hope that the jet is a proxy for your hard partons in your, in your event. So it's a way to see exactly what your hard partons is, are, sorry. This really has to be taken with a grain of salt, yes? No. Uh, 
I'm re I'm removing muons out of the game and then considering only the QCD particles in the event. So imagine you have a final state which is e plus and minus two muons. Then this doesn't apply. I'm just so I just have two muons and two muons. Muons are muons. So the, the the way that would work, and again, this is generic. If you have an event which is both, say leptons and uh, and and hadrons. What you would typically first do is saying, I'm, or say lepton photons and, and, and muons, I'm just selecting, finding in my event which are the photons, finding in my event which are the muons or electrons. This, is, this goes in a list, and then all the rest of the hadronic activity, or all the hadronic activity, goes into another list, and this is the list I'm, I'm, I'm trying to analyze here. Uh, it's, in, in practice, actually, in, or at least in experimental context, things are never as easy as this. Uh, for example, you imagine you have a B quark somewhere in, uh, in the hadronic activity. That B quark will decay, and in its decay, it's going to produce a muon. So sometimes you do have other particles. You do have non-QCD particles, or I don't know, a quark can radiate a photon, for example. If a quark radiates a photon, then you're in that photon probably better be associated with the quark than with the, uh, is it a hard photon? Is it not a hard photon? So ex in an experimental context, it's, the, the situation is a bit more complicated. And the distinction is not always exactly as you would think. Uh, other examples are purely practical. Uh, many particle Many of these uh, QCD particles tend to produce pions at the end of the day. Okay, that's the basic QCD hadrons and mesons. Uh, what does a pi zero decay into? Two photons. So in, in practice, for many of these cases, you actually don't see directly QCD activity. You see electromagnetic activity. Uh, because actually what you see is the two photon decaying from a pion. And so experimentally being able to separate two photons coming from a pion from a single photon may sometimes not be exactly as easy as, as, easy as you think. Uh, so I'm just going to swipe everything under the rug and say next time invite an experimentalist if you want to speak about all of this. Uh, I, I'm happy to answer or try to do my best to answer questions if there are, but at least for the purpose of this basic lecture, this is just assuming that you have a bunch of leptons, you have a bunch of photons, and you have a bunch of hadrons. And I'm assuming I can make this distinction uh, with 100% certainty, at least for uh, the purpose of doing a theoretical calculation. The rest is experimental business, okay? And at least even in QCD 105, this is not yet the approximation where I have to worry about this. Uh, so yeah, in, in this case, it's mostly, well, in this case, essentially, in, in this type of process, you either start with e plus and minus going to mu plus mu minus, or e plus and minus, or q q bar. So most uh, cases where you have a mixture of muons and, uh, and QCD activity are not that frequent in the, in the e plus and minus context. Uh, there will be if you start producing Ws and things like that, of course, but... Uh, so, yeah, in, in this case, this is, I'm assuming the final state is purely hadronic, and if the final state is not purely hadronic, then the rest can be sifted in a, in a, separate, uh, in a separate list and treated separately. I'm going to come back to this probably when we discuss proton-proton collisions because everyday life at the LHC uh, has a mixture of all these guys, and so this, this would be more relevant in that case than, than in this case. So in this case, I'm just assuming final state is purely, is purely hadronic, and, and that's something you can probably live with uh, fairly easily. So where was I? Anything fishy with this basic picture? You don't see partons. Not only you don't see partons, so a, a jet, at the end of the day, what a, trying to lean towards, is that a parton is not something which is well-defined, let alone a hard parton. The hard is completely, what you call hard, what you call soft. That's just uh, a matter of taste. I'm pretty sure if I ask you all to write on a, on a sheet of paper, what do you mean by hard, what do you mean by parton, I'm at least going to come back with 10 different answers, okay? so. 
this is, so the right hand side of this equality sign is at best shaky, okay? Uh, the question here, really the key question is, can you make the left hand side well defined? And by well defined, I mean something which is in particular infrared and clean are safe. And that makes sense. That's something which doesn't depend on uh, what you mean by a hard or soft pardon. It may have parameters in it. It will have parameters in it. But at least, uh, let me put quotation marks here. And really, this is the concept. Okay, going from the concept to reality, essentially you should keep this as a picture. You want at the end of the day that the jets you get of the whatever way is going to define them is going to be respecting this picture. But at the end of the day, there's some freedom and this, is, this should be solid. This is just a picture. Okay, I insist on this because this is... Uh, uh, this is something you often hear uh, when people talk about having jets in the final state. The idea is often that yeah, they have hard part in the final state, and so that should give them jets at the end of the day. But in practice, there are corrections around this, in particular QCD corrections, because uh, the concept of a pardon is, is sensitive to uh, QCD corrections as well. So. For today, I'm going to discuss jets in E plus and minus collisions. I'm going to come back to jets in proton-proton collisions uh, probably two days from now, maybe three, Wednesday or Thursday, depending on progress. Uh, so in E plus and minus collisions, the situation is uh, a bit more simple than in proton-proton collisions. The idea here is, so the idea here is find the procedure that is able to give you a list of jets at the end of the day, whatever that means, a list of objects that you will call jets, given the list of particles in the final state. Okay? So you want something where I give you a list of particles, whatever is in the final state, all these lines in the uh, pseudo events there, and it finds the circles. Okay? It finds these directions, the, the, the green arrows. So there's many ways to do that. The historical way is actually called the Sturman Weinberg cone uh, algorithm if you wish. And I never remember if it's 77 or 79. So this is roughly 40 years old. Okay? And the idea really goes along the line of that, that concept. You're going to say that an event is n jets. if all the energy in the event I should stop writing in capital letters, this is awfully slow uh, is contained In N, N remains capital, uh, cones, and a cone here is really some angle somewhere. So think about E plus E minus as being a spherical type of collision where you have E plus E minus going in the center and everything flowing from that center. So you're really starting to think of a cone, so which is a, a region of, of solid angle somewhere in the, uh, on this sphere. So if this is the E plus E minus collision with the center here, you do get a sphere somewhere. I'm, I'm awful at drawing in three dimensions again. 
so think about a sphere somewhere like this, I'm really thinking about some regions of solid angle here, which is circular at the end. So it's a cone of half angle, half opening angle, uh, delta, let's call it delta. Uh, not at minus one. So essentially here, I'm saying I need to be able to put all the particles up there. So I'm fixing delta. There's a parameter. So I fix delta. I'm giving you one value of delta. And so for one value of delta, this is essentially giving you the size of these conical objects I want to, I want to use. And essentially, I'm telling you, I'm just going to look at how many of these cones I need to capture the energy, all the particles in your event. Okay? Is that collinear safe? If I have a particle which is somewhere in one of these cones and it splits into two particles exactly in the same direction, these two particles remain in the same cone. So the part that captures all my particles hasn't changed. So this is collinear safe. And in a way, this delta is exactly there to just regularize this collinear divergence. I'm just saying, instead of looking at really partons and the particle, if you start looking at particles, individual particles, you have the risk that this particle splits collinearly, and when they split separately, you don't have one, but you have two particles. And so the idea here is just don't look too close. Don't look at particles. Look at somewhere with a, a, a bigger angular resolution. And by looking with a bigger angular resolution, if one particle splits into two with that bigger resolution, I don't see it, so I'm not sensitive to it. Okay, so that's really the uh, that's really the idea. Delta is just there to regularize, explicitly regularizing the collinear divergence. Is that infrared safe? Coming back to this event, uh, imagine this is delta. Imagine, so I've been able to capture all my lines inside three cones. So you're going to say this is a three jet event. What if I add a soft particle in here? You still need to capture it, right? So this means that you'll need to add a fourth one. All right? So is that the infrared safe? Nope. So I didn't make a lift. I didn't leave this blank just uh, randomly, right? Uh, fine. Let's explicitly get rid of this. I'm going to say I am allowing myself to miss some fraction of the energy. Okay? If I'm missing some fraction of the energy, I'm adding a soft particle to flux. It falls in that, frac in that soft fraction of the energy. It's that in that fraction I'm allowed to miss. Okay? Uh, so this is a very brute force way of constructing things, okay? I'm saying I have an infrared divergence. I have a collinear divergence. I'm just going to explicitly regularize them. I introduced one, particle del one parameter delta, which explicitly smooth out the collinear divergences, and a parameter epsilon which explicitly cuts the infrared divergence. Okay? 
This is perfectly well valid. Just to give you an example, if I go back to this e plus e minus to QQ bar gluon, so what you can try to measure in all these cases, all these algorithms are essentially going to classify the event according to how many jets you have in there, okay? So with, with this, if you fix, th there's two ways of viewing the problem. Either you fix the parameters, so in this case I can fix delta and epsilon, right? And just classify the, the event according to how many jets you have. So for a given delta and epsilon, you can have some fraction of the events is going to be two jets, some fraction of the events are going to be three jets, four jets, five jets, and so on and so forth. So hopefully in QCD, you're able to calculate these rates for two, three, four, five, ten jets in your event. Uh, conversely, you can say I'm looking just at events in which there are two jets and I'm varying any of those parameters and so I'm looking at how the fraction of two jet events, for example, varies as a function of delta and epsilon. And again, this is something you hope you're able to calculate in productive QCD and you hope to be able to compare to data and learn something about QCD and its, and its structure. Measure alpha S is again one, one of the options here. So I'll do an explicit calculation of not for the standard Weinberg cone, but for, uh, for another one, for the next one, actually. Uh, but let me still discuss this a little bit. First of all, let's go back to the case of, yes? Let me allow to pass for the moment and come back to this with the next uh, with the next algorithm. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll even come back to this point later. So let's try to calculate what happens in the case of the. Uh, let's try to do a QCD calculation of this. Okay. If you do a QCD calculation of this, you're going to e plus e minus two QQ bar. That's always two jets. Okay. There's a quark in one direction, an anti-quark in the opposite direction. Uh, whatever delta, whatever epsilon, well, unless you take epsilon larger than one half, or I don't know. Yeah, energy here is in a fraction of square root of s. So unless you take epsilon bigger than one half, there's always a quark carrying 50% of the energy on one side, an anti-quark 50% on the other side. So there's always two jet events unless you're uh, asking a nonsensical question. So the first interesting case is e plus e minus going to give you bar gluon, so first order alpha s corrections in, uh, in your event. And here again, you see if this gluon becomes infinitely soft, uh, this is going to be, so soft by soft, I mean smaller than the fraction epsilon of the energy, this is going to be a two jet event, and the, the soft divergence is going to cancel against the virtual corrections, which are two jets as well. And if that gluon becomes collinear, if that gluon becomes collinear, then again, this is also going, by collinear I mean at an angle smaller than delta, this is again going to be classified as a two jet event and cancel against the, the uh, corresponding virtual corrections, which are also uh, considered as two jets. So only when that gluon is hard enough and not collinear enough, will this be a three jet event? So the only thing I like to look into is the conditions for, for, for this gluon, for this event to be qualified as, uh, as three jet. So I need, uh, by definition, I need three jets. So I need each of my three, uh, I need each of my three partons to have an energy bigger than epsilon, because if any of these partons falls below epsilon, it's actually inside my allowed miscible fractions. This would be a two-jet event. <clears throat> and you also need that the angles theta 1, 2, theta 1, 3, and theta 2, 3 are bigger than, uh, than epsilon as well. Okay. Sorry? Uh, delta, delta, delta. Sorry, my mistake. 
Good. Yeah, I just use a different notation here, but tough luck, you can live with that. So in principle, if you were to calculate the rate for having three jet events in QCD, the first contribution would be alpha s, you'd be integrating the above cross section with that phase space. Okay, the phase space being that all the x's have to be bigger than epsilon, and all the angles have to be bigger than delta. Obviously, this regulates, this doesn't include x1 or x2 equals 1, because if x1 or x2 goes to 1, you either have to have x3, which is small, or one of these angles, which is small, and by small here, I mean going to 0. So these explicitly regulate, and you're guaranteed to get a 3-jet rate, which is finite. Uh, the fact that it's angles and not... Uh, well, angles are actually not, easy, not so easy to deal with, uh, mostly because in E plus E minus, it's actually easy to think about this. An amplitude always has scalar products and leaving masses aside, okay? All amplitudes are going to involve scalar products of either outgoing particles or cross products between outgoing and incoming particles. Uh, in this case, it's only products between uh, outgoing particles because I've integrated over, every, over the orientation of the plane, so there's, there's nothing left between uh, initial and, and final state particles. Uh, and all these dot products do not involve angle per se, they actually involve one minus cosine of the angles all the time, or cosine of the angles. So this is actually, the first thing you would do in this case is actually not write things down in terms of theta, but in terms of one minus cos theta, and so you'll get one minus cos delta actually all over the place instead of delta itself. Uh, again, this is just a, a note in passing. You'll see one, well, usually you rather see one minus cos angles rather than angles because they come from scalar products. Uh, so this is all fine. You can do that, you can get a finite answer. It's mostly a back of an envelope calculation. You'll get a three jet rate. I will not do it here. I'll do it for the next example of a jet algorithm. There's one reason why this has never really been used in practice. Uh, can anyone see what's quickly becoming prohibitive with this kind of algorithm? That's one way of phrasing it, yes. Uh, Imagine you start going to alpha squared, okay? So either going to alpha squared, or imagine you're in a really realistic situation where you have particles all over the place. So tens of particles in your final state. Starting to find the minimum n so that you could put everything into, into angular cones, so in, into these conical regions, not that trivial, right? So one, practically speaking, implementing this is not easy in terms of an experimental context. Two, computing this, the set of constraints, so the, uh, at order alpha s, the set of constraints we have is very simple. This is just a bunch. If you, want, if you were to calculate the three jet rate, you just integrate this with a theta x1 bigger than epsilon, x2 bigger than epsilon, x3 bigger than epsilon, all angles which I can rewrite as x's bigger than epsilon as well, and it's something that's bigger than, than, than delta. Uh, shouldn't that be too complicated to get an answer? At alpha squared is already becoming more complicated because you can have, uh, to have three jets, you can have any pair of particles that start being in the same, in the same code. Uh, and circles are not exactly the best way to pave a sphere. So, at some point, you can have things which start overlapping, and, and again, kinematically, this quickly becomes extremely prohibitive, okay? So, conceptually, this is great. Practically, mm, limited value, okay? So, people have started thinking about something different. And the something different has different flavors to it, the generic idea, 
is the following one. And instead of giving you, well, no, instead of giving you the generic ID, I'll give you the, uh, the explicit algorithm that has been used. People came with something called the Jade algorithm. And they said, well, 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 let's try to think, instead of thinking practically in terms of regulating divergences, let's try to think about where do these divergences come from. In all cases, if I go back to what we were discussing yesterday, whether this is soft or collinear, what happens when this is either soft or collinear, if you remember what you said yesterday, This guy here starts to become on shell. And by on shell, it means that this guy here starts having a small virtuality, if you wish. Small virtuality essentially means that this system K1, K3 starts having a low invariant mass, because virtuality in this case is just the invariant mass of the pair. So the invariant mass of K1 and K3 is small. So we can turn this to our advantage. We can actually look at all the invariant masses of well, the invariant mass of any pair of particles in the event, and if something is small, it means it's probably coming from either a soft or a collinear branching, and so we don't we do want these particles to be part of the same jet because they probably come from some common nearly on-shell ancestor. Okay. So the idea of the jade algorithm is, and again, I'm going to try and stick to the notations because otherwise uh, next expressions are going to be awful. It's really, you're going to compute all mij squared, which is typically k1, ki plus kj squared, and that's for massless particles, again, it's 2 ei ej 1 minus cosine theta ij. So I'm going to build all the mij square in the event, all possible pairs. I'm going to find minimum mij square. And then I'm just going to recombine I plus J into, I don't know, KI and KJ into KI plus KJ. So I'm taking these two particles, removing them, and replacing them essentially by the sum. Okay? So I had, imagine you start with N objects in your, in your event. This gives you n minus 1. And I'm going to repeat this. So the, really the idea here is try to find among all these pairs which one corresponds, which one is essentially the most likely to come from one of these soft or collinear splittings, and then undo this. So if you have dozens of these soft and collinear branchings, I'm just going to undo them all, okay? And undoing them all, I, the hope is that at the end of the day, I do find the basic heart structure of my event, all right? So if you think about this, if you think about these kinds of picture here as being a succession of soft and collinear branchings, the only thing that this kind of recipe does is trying to undo the, the branching history that led from the bunch of hard quarks and gluons, hard quarks and gluons, that led at the end of the day to these more complicated structures, okay? And we know that the most likely branchings that led to this are essentially either hard or collinear, sorry, uh, soft, or, soft or collinear, for which the, inv the, the, the invariant mass is actually a small quantity, all right? Uh, 
if I do that, at the end of the day, I'm actually going to get a single object because I'm going to repeat this over and over again until there's no pair left, okay? So there's one thing missing here, which is a stopping criterion, okay? And there's different, probably different conventions here. So you're actually going to repeat until the minimum mij squared is larger than, there's only one scale in the problem in this case, which is s, and so a fraction of s. Fraction, it's customary to code this y cut. What are the parameters here? Where is my freedom in this algorithm? Why cut? There's only one. There's, well, S is fixed. Uh, this is my final state. I don't have any control over this. So there's only parameter which is Y cut. Is this infrared and Kernier safe? Is this Kernier safe? What happens if I do split two particles with infinitesimally small angle anywhere? Cosine would be one, essentially their invariant mass goes to zero, and if at some point I have a zero in my list of, uh, in, in my list of masses, this is going to be, there, these two particles are going to be recombined essentially from the first step of the, of, of the recipe, okay? So if I happen to split something with infinitely really small angle, the first thing I'm going to do is just undo this, uh, undo this, this Kernier splitting, okay? Uh, same thing, if I emit something which is infinitesimally small, then again, uh, the corresponding invariant mass squared is infinitesimally, infinitesimally small as well, and so the first thing this guy, this recipe is going to do is undoing this soft emission I've just, I've just added, okay? Undoing, just re reclustering it, recombining it with essentially the particle that has emitted it, and so you don't change anything about the list of jets you have at the end of the day. So this kind of algorithm is almost trivially infrared and Kernier safe. Okay? And this is something for which I'm going to uh, give you the calculation in uh, in QCD because it only has one parameter and this is something for which we can easily get an answer. So, I'm going back here. I have an event, Cucobar Gluon, and what I'm going to calculate is, uh, what I do want is what is the fraction of events for which I'm going to have three jets, okay? So same procedure as what we used yesterday for thrust. Uh, it's a fraction, and so I'm going to divide by whatever uh, cross-section I want, whatever normalization you want here. There's an integration dx1, dx2. There's going to be your d sigma there, d sigma dx1, dx2. And then given x1 and x2, I need here a set of constraints that guarantee that for a, the given value of x1 and x2, I have exactly three jets in my event. Okay? Can anyone tell me what's the condition to have three jets? That's so that both the quark, antiquark, and gluon end up in their own jet. Exactly. So by definition, if you look there, I'm actually going to stop recombining things when 
all the MIJs I'm left with are bigger than square root of y cut s. Okay? So if any of the pairwise mass between k1, k2, and k3 is smaller than square root of y cut s, these two guys are going to be ring mine, and I'm going to end up with only at most two jets. Okay? So it means that I need that m, say m i2, well, let's try m, yeah, let's try m 3 squared s to be bigger than y cut s, and m13 squared is 2e1, e3, 1 minus cosine theta13, which is 2, so remember that e1 is square root of s over 2 times x1, so this gives me s over 2 x1, x3, and then 1 minus cosine theta 1, 3, well, haha, -ha. 1 minus cosine, let me keep it that way, and 1 half x1, x3, 1 minus cosine theta 1, 3, that's the back of an envelope calculation we did yesterday, which is 1 minus x2. So, times s. So this means if this condition transforms into x2 smaller than 1 minus y cut. Okay, you can repeat this trivial exercise for any pair and you're going to get that any of the xi has to be smaller than 1 minus y cut. Okay. All right? So that's x2 small, no, that's x1 as well. And you also get x3 smaller than 1 minus y cut, which you can rewrite x3 as 1 minus x1 minus x2. So at the end of the day, this set of constraints give you that x1 plus x2 has to be bigger than 1 plus y cut. So this goes here, essentially theta x1 smaller 1 minus y cut, theta x2 smaller 1 minus y cut, theta x1 plus x2 bigger 1 plus y cut. Everyone's okay so far? So this is essentially a similar rational function integrated over a reasonably simple linear phase space. So if you want to see what, it, what this looks like, uh, probably an easy way to view this is if I do plot something which would be x1 on this axis, x2 on that axis. They all need to be somewhere between 0 and 1. So this would be the phase space. Uh, then you need x3 to be smaller than 1, and if x3 is smaller than 1, it means x1 plus x2 has to be bigger than 1. So this upper triangle there is actually the all phase space available for x1 and x2 without any constraint with divergences present along this line you have the cases where x2 goes to 1 so this is the divergences uh, either soft or, well in this case this is divergences which are collinear well, just x2 goes to 1 is the case where uh, you're collinear to x2 sorry it's collinear to uh, to, to k1. Along this part of the graph, it's x1 going to 1, so it's the part when cosine theta 2, 3 uh, is small. And close to the top here, it's essentially part of the soft and collinear divergence. Okay? 
So divergences lie in this part of the phase space, and then they can be either soft or collinear, depending on where, on where you sit here. What I'm saying here is that if I impose a Y cut, I'm imposing that at the end of the day, this has to be smaller than 1 minus Y cut. Smaller than 1 minus Y cut for X1. And bigger than the sum here for the other ones. So at the end of the day, I'm only integrating things in this region of the phase space. And you see that this region of the phase space is free, is standing clear of the dangerous region x1 is 1 or x2 is 1. It's obvious from here, right? Again, y cut here plays the role of shielding, regulating, cutting away the uh, region where you would have or you could have a divergence, okay? So this is essentially why, explicitly why this algorithm is safe. Your mass cannot really be zero because if you have a mass which is smaller than y cut s, so some x which is too close to one, then these particles are going to be recombined and you will not have three z in this case. So actually this integration can be done uh, At the end of the day, I never remember the answer. I, well, so you, do in, you, you can do this integration sticking that rational function in. At the end of the day, what you do get is alpha CF over 2 pi, I would say. Yes, 2 pi. There's a term which is 2 log square y over 1. My, y is standing for y cut here. I'm just trying to gain some space plus 3, 1 minus 2y log y, y minus 2y, uh, minus pi square over 3, plus uh, 4 di logarithm of y over 1 minus y, plus some rational, well, some polynomial, 12y minus 9y square over 2. Why the hell do I bother with this? What's interesting in that expression? I can give you a hint, we're physicists, not mathematicians, so I don't care about the fact that this has factors of pi in here. Say that again? It depends on alpha s. That's, I mean, that you could probably have guessed uh, already from here. We're doing an alpha, another alpha s calculation. So if it's not just alpha s times something, it means you've done something wrong. Uh, but right, it depends on alpha s. Uh, it depends on alpha s if I can carry on in that direction. It depends on alpha s times cf. So there's some information about uh, the gauge group of QCD somewhere in there. Uh, there's more interesting. So the, if I can rephrase my question, why the hell did I bother give you the exact expression in that, in that bracket? Yes. I'm not sure I follow you. Yes, it's, that's the dial algorithm. I never remember exactly in which direction it's defined. Uh, it's an integration and it's something like, so this in principle diverges when x would go to one, so something like, Something like that. And I never remember the exact normalization of this or the exact uh, sign of this. So uh, 
there's a chance that it's between zero and Z. That's something, yeah, there's a few things in life where you, once you realize you won't remember it, you know you won't remember it for the rest of your life. This is one of these examples. So uh, that's something that I should know and I don't, but okay, something along those lines. Uh, the only thing I know is that if you take Z to zero, this pi square over six. Uh, There's a term which is independent of y. Uh, yeah, there's a pi square. Well, ha ha ha. Uh, yeah, there's a term. Yeah, there's a five half and a pi square over three. So, okay. Let me go back one step in this case. Uh, There's again two ways to view this problem. There are two ways to view this problem. One is I'm just going to look at how many, what was the fraction, for a given y, I'm going to get the fraction of how many events have two jets, how many events have three jets. So, or four jets, five jets, etc. At this order of QCD, I can only have three jets. That's the maximum number of parents I have. I cannot have more than three jets. So, but I, I still have a prediction. This is the rate for having three jets. What's the rate for having two jets? Essentially one minus this, yes. So there's either two or three. So if, it's, if I take a rate for one, the other one, the sum is one. So uh, I do have a prediction. That prediction I can compare, I can measure this experimentally and check whether I do have something precise or not. Don't expect something too precise, uh, mostly because in practice you'll have four, five, six jet events, uh, more rare, but still, uh, this is essentially just going to be a ballpark first order estimate in QCD. The other option is just to try and look at the three jet rate as a function of y. So I'm going to vary y and see exactly that gives me a function. That function as a function of y I can measure either experimentally by, vary, by taking some different values of y and doing this for different values of y or by just taking it, this analytic expression and plotting it as a function of y. Why do you ex what do you expect if you start plotting this as a function of y? Singularities, Singularities yes. Where? Do I care about y equals 1? There's 1, there's 1 half, and there's 0. OK. There's 1 I do care about. There's 2 I don't give a damn. So that, essentially, that's what I said earlier. Go back to the recipe up there. Uh, taking y cut equals either 1 half or 1 doesn't really make sense. I'm essentially saying I, I'm going to stop when the mass, the invariant mass is larger than either 1 half s or s. That's a scale which is way too big. In, all, in these cases, you're always going to get exactly two jets. Mostly because, uh, yeah, if you start e plus e minus going to QQ bar, that's essentially the kind of scale you're going to get. Well, it's S. So that, that would correspond to 1. 1 half is about a similar situation. And it's not really a divergent because there's a 1 minus 2 Y in front of it. So actually, 1 half is not, uh, is not divergent. Uh, 1 would be divergent, but in the case of 1, you would still all the time have something where where you only have two jets in your event. So in pre, yeah, so this is not necessarily uh, the limit that you would be interested in. So that leaves y equals zero. What happens when you approach y equals zero? In the limit where y is very small, y 
you get alpha SCF over 2 pi times 2 log square of y plus 3. This does diverge. All right? This does blow up when y becomes small. Why? What's the physical reason for that? Exactly. You go back to this set of, to these, either this set of constraints or to the recipe there above. Y is exactly there to shield your infrared and Kuhnian divergences. The minute you start taking Y extremely small, you're essentially moving this constraint here closer and closer to the region where you start feeling the 1 over 1 minus x1 and the 1 over 1 minus x2. And at some point, even though you get something which remains finite, so for any given non-zero value of y, you'll get a finite number, you're essentially going to integrate this 1 over 1 minus x1 all the way to a number which becomes closer and closer to 1. And so this is going to give you a log of whatever uh, closeness to one you are to, okay? Uh, why you log square? No? Soft and collinear. You have a limit where if you wish, both x1 and x2 can go close to 1. And in this case, you need to be at the same time soft and collinear. If both, say, theta 1, 3 goes to 0 and x3 goes to, uh, sorry, theta 1, 3 goes to 0 and x3 and x1 goes to 1, in, uh, or x3 goes to 0, at the same, you'll be at the same time soft and collinear, and so you will get one log from the fact that you're soft and one log from the fact that you're collinear. Or said differently, you'll get one log from the x1 going close to 1 and one log from the x2 going close to 1. Uh, so this double log really comes from uh, essentially this corner of the phase space. And again, this is, this is where things become interesting because if you take y too small, this means that this actually, this is something you expect to be perturbative QCD, right? So perturbative QCD, alpha s is small, number compared to one. Then like, if, if you want to compute the next correction, I'm going to go to alpha squared. So you're going to get two gluon emission or I don't know, these gluons splitting to QQ bar or something like that. But there's a finite number of Feynman graphs you want to compute for next to leading order of all the, all the alpha square corrections. And uh, still, you expect the alpha square correction, maybe except in some cases where, I don't know, phase space constraints are a bit complicated, where uh, rare occasions where you do have new processes in the game. But generally speaking, in the perturbative theory, you expect alpha squared to be a small correction to alpha, which is itself a small correction compared to one in the, in the zeroth order. Uh, in the limit where y becomes small, so in the limit where alpha s log square of y becomes close to one, uh, this smallness or this, this, this series expansion in terms of the coupling is not going to give you anything valid, anything you can thrust, okay? It will give you an answer. Again, it's finite, but it's not something that you're able to trust in the sense that if you start cal calculating the next order, the alpha square correction, you're going to get something which is equiv equivalently large, maybe even larger, and then your perturbative expansion does not make sense. So, and again, the idea here is that these terms, in principle, have to be included all orders of perturbation theory. So this is, uh, this is where all order calculations or resummations have to take place because you're close enough to soft and green divergences that they need to be included at all orders if you want to recover uh, 
some sense out of your prerogative QCD calculation, okay? And this is something that you should keep in mind. Whenever you have some small parameter or some different scales, in this case, it's really different scales. It, well, it's either a small parameter, so y much smaller than one, or a, a difference in scale. Essentially, the scale y cut s becomes much more different, widely different from the hard scale s in your problem. Whenever you have widely separated scales, you should expect that soft and collinear emissions are going to give you logs in your answer. If you're sensitive to collinear physics, you get one log. If you're sensitive to soft physics, if that scale is sensitive to soft physics, it's going to give you a different log. If you're sensitive to both soft and collinear emissions, you will get squared logarithms. This is something that you will, you will see over and over again in QCD. Whenever you have different scale, you will have a situation like this. And this is something where pure perturbative theory can no longer be blindly trusted. Okay, you need to supplement it with no order treatment. Uh, side question. This kind of thing, what happens if instead of having e plus e minus to q q bar gluon, I do e plus e minus to mu plus mu minus photon? can play the same kind of game. Or either, so the case of thrust we discussed yesterday was exactly the same. We had logs in thrust as well, uh, which were, again, double kind of logs where you were sensitive to both soft and collinear physics. You can, I can just decide to apply the same algorithm based defining lepton jets, if you wish, uh, based on my photons and muons. Uh, I will not get exactly the same metric elements. I would not get CF factors, for example. I won't get color factors. Would I get logs? Of course you would. The photon can as well be collinear to the mu one, and the photon can as well be soft. And those, exactly, those are exactly the same infrared. I mean, the same diagram, if you think about it, it's trivial. Uh, they come from this propagator being on shell. It doesn't care whether this is a quark and a gluon or whether this is a muon and a photon. Have you ever heard about all order resummations in QED? Probably not. Why? This is the real question. Why can I live with just fixed order QED without having to worry probably ever? QCD is renormalizable as well. Renormalizability is UV. This is not UV. This is infrared. Exactly. So the, the minute at which you start having to worry about this guy is essentially the minute when this logarithm become large. If I stick here alpha electromagnetic, this is 1 over 100, it means I need a log of 10, and the log of, the, it means I need two scales separated by 10 orders of magnitude. This is something that never happened, uh, is probably not going to happen in any collider anytime soon, okay? So this is essentially the reason why. These logs are present somehow in, uh, in QED as well. It's just that they're tiny. You just don't give a damn about them. You don't need to treat them any specifically. You're never in a region, or we've never been so far at least, and probably won't be in, the, in any time in the near future, in a region where these logarithms are of any importance. Okay? So there's two things I, or, well, there's two other things I'd like to mention in this context. Uh, the first one is actually the gene algorithm is great, but has a bad behavior. There's one case where the gene algorithm is not quite doing what you want. Imagine this is my event, that's the center of mass. I have a quark here, I have a quark there, I have a gluon here, and I have a gluon there. How many jets in here? Yeah, two. That seems, I mean, again, 
naively, right? Uh, this can be four depending on your choice of parameters, right? Uh, but naively speaking, your gut feeling that this is a two-jet event. And your gut feeling is as well that this gluon was emitted collinear here and this gluon was emitted collinear there, okay? That, that's again your, your basic gut feeling. Uh, in, in practice though, uh, if you start comparing computing invariant masses, uh, you'll get, you get some situations where because these two gluons can be soft, actually the algorithm is going to recombine these two first. And when you close the threshold, uh, you can actually get a situation where these two are, are recombined here, and you actually do get a three-jet event where your third jet is actually borrowing particles from near collinear regions on both sides, okay? Uh, this is something per se that is not problematic. I mean, it's, it is what it is. Uh, in terms of trying to understand the QCD structures of this guy, this is something that is becoming problematic. So tr if you try to compute, to make precise QCD calculations with a JD algorithm, this is something that is going to come and bite you at some point and bite you hard in a way that, that reaching precision is, is not necessarily uh, going to be easy, okay? So for that reason, people started thinking about different ways, about ways redefining this procedure in a way to avoid that kind of problem. And essentially this problem comes from the fact that you have two factors of the energy here. So when you have two soft particles, you actually get two small terms in the mass because these two gluons are, are this, themselves soft. And so the idea, I've completely made a mess in my notes. Uh, the idea to avoid that is actually to get here something which becomes linear instead of quadratic. And this is something known as the, the KT algorithm. Also known as a Durham algorithm. And the idea is essentially the same, except I'm going to replace the pairwise measure instead of using the mass I'm going to use something which is called DIJ, uh, let me call it with a subscript KT, which is two times the minimum <coughs> of EI and EJ squared, one minus cosine theta IJ. Is it in front and are safe? Again, the procedure goes as before. If two particles are collinear, this distance becomes close to zero because of this factor. So a collinear splitting is going to, well, the rest of the procedure goes as follows. It goes without saying, right? I'm just, the procedure is the same. I'm finding the minimum DIJ, recombining those particles with the minimum and repeating until, uh, uh, until the DIJ is bigger than Y cut times, uh, times S. I can again look at this exactly the same way as I did for Jade as a function of Y cut. It is collinear safe because the distance goes to zero in the collinear limit, so any collinear pair is going to recombine early on. And it is also soft, uh, infrared safe, because if I have a particle with zero energy, uh, this distance also goes to zero, all right? So it is also something uh, for which you get something which is infrared and collinear safe. And in, 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 a, in a case of an event like this, this particle is actually going to be combined with the right uh, high hard guy, and this particle is going to be combined with the left hard guy, okay? I think this is, yeah. There's another example, but I'll come back to that when we discuss proton-proton collisions. I will not get it covered here. Any questions at this stage? So the JED and KT algorithms have both been used at LEP. There are uh, I forgot to send you a link to the notes. I'll try to solve that out this afternoon. There's, uh, let me try to check here. This is, 
Yeah, these plots, if you can see them on my sheet of paper here, these plots are actually data from LEP where they used uh, the 3-jet rate from Jade and the nth jet rate from, uh, from uh, KT or, or Jade. Or you can measure as well the 3-jet rate, say, for KT as a function of square root of S. And the hope is, again, to extract alpha S from this. Okay. Uh, the KT algorithm is also something that has been computed fairly precisely in, in QCD. Uh, you also get things like, well, these logarithms of soft and cleaner origin are exactly the same. Well, you get different coefficients, but you also get double and single logs because the Y cut only shields the uh, infrared and cleaner divergences without really preventing you from going as close as possible to it. By, uh, by lowering y cut. Uh, so there's also lots of efforts in the literature to try and improve the resummation, the order treatment of these logarithms with higher and higher accuracy, so including more and more of them. Uh, and the case of the KT algorithm is actually something for which you can, you can actually do reach uh, a decent accuracy. So the last thing I'd like to do about, uh, about these E plus and minus collisions, and tomorrow we'll move to, uh, to DIS. I was actually thinking I'd, I'd be there already quite some time ago, but okay, that's, I can live with this, is, is discuss two interesting limits. So go back to the expression up there, amplitudes and cross-section, and discuss two interesting limits, okay? Uh, because, again, the structure that comes out, it's something that pops out everywhere in, in, in QCD. And so I find it interesting to at least point out. Uh, the first case is the case where the gluon is purely soft, okay? Uh, and again, let me make sure I do have the right uh, message, messages I want to get across. Yeah, this is the one. So if the gluon is soft, let me go back to the amplitude there at the far top of the blackboard, okay? If the amplitude is soft, uh, you can actually, so th the amplitude up there is the amplitude for QQ bar gluon. I can write down in a very similar way the amplitude for QQ bar. So if you try to look at the same amplitude, I, I didn't do it yesterday because it was essentially two textbook. The amplitude for just QQ bar can be written in that case as, again, constant, which is 32 times, no, that's not possible. Uh, no, that's 4 times 2 pi squared times alpha electromagnetic squared times NC charge squared times P1 dot K1 squared times P1 dot K2 squared plus P2 K1 squared plus P2 K2 squared over K1 dot K2 squared. So this would be the amplitude you'd get if you were doing exactly the same exercise, but just E plus E minus going to UQ bar. Uh, the reason I'm writing that is now if you take the expression at the top of the blackboard, and decide to take K3, which is soft. If K3 is soft, it means that up to small corrections, the K1 and K2 you get for the quark and the antiquark, they're essentially the same. The K1 that you get there is essentially the K1 that you get here. And the, so the quark and antiquark, if you have a soft emission, the K1 and the momenta of K1 of, of the quark and the antiquark are essentially unmodified, okay? And in this case, you do get that the amplitude for QQ bar gluon is essentially the amplitude for QQ bar times 8 pi alpha SCF times uh, K1 dot K2 over K1 dot K3, K3 dot K2. And similarly speaking, you can uh, write down the phase space for these three-body system as the phase space 
for your two-body system times d4 k3 over 2 pi to the fourth, 2 pi delta of k3, that's essentially the only shell condition for, for this guy, that's... Uh, And in that case, the only thing I'm doing is neglecting K3 in, moment, in energy momentum conservation because it's soft, and so it's only, including K3 in energy momentum conservation is only going to give me subleading corrections. So again, this, is, this thing is only valid in the limit where K3 is soft. Okay, so I'm, all the equal signs here, all the approximately equal signs are, are to be understood in the limit where K3 becomes soft. All right? So I can neglect it in the numerator here or in the numerator up there, and I can neglect it in energy momentum conservation. So this means at the end of the day that whenever you get an emission like that, you're actually going to get a factor here combined from the two compared to the amplitude or the cross-section with no such uh, soft gluon. You get a factor which is alpha S CF over pi squared times k1 dot k2 over k1 dot k3, k3 dot k2, times d 4 k3 delta k3 squared. This is important for two reasons. The first one is it's really a factorization here. What I'm really telling you here is that I can, in the soft limit, that process can be factorized into e plus e minus going to QQ bar, essentially times a radiation of this soft gluon from the QQ bar pair. All right? This is the key expression. This is something known as the antenna formula. And it essentially tells you that whenever you have a soft gluon emitted from a hard QQ bar line, a hard QQ bar dipole in this case, it will give you such a factor, all right? And this factor has some soft divergence is going from the fact that K1 and, well, that, that, that the denominator blows up in the soft divergence. So if you're interested in soft gluon emissions, instead of having, imagine you're interested in two or three such soft gluon emissions, I don't need to compute the full matrix element. The only thing I need is insert for each soft gluon emission such a factor. So whenever you start discussing soft gluon emissions, uh, there's a simplification where each emission is actually going to come with such a factor, okay? It's actually also related to something known as the icon approximation, where if you emit, the idea is if you emit a gluon from such a line here, you can neglect the recoil of the, of the quark with respect to the gluon, with, due to the emission of the gluon, so this quark still essentially flies in a straight direction in this, its, its original direction, meaning I'm actually neglecting all sorts of correction to the hard matrix element and only including some extra factor coming from the emission itself. And that factor here is what's going to capture the dominance of the emission, the, behavior, the dominant behavior due to soft blown emissions. So this expression is actually something you, you find repeatedly in the literature. Uh, this is done for quark, anti-quark. You can do the same thing if you have gluon, gluon here. Okay, forget about the left part of the diagram. But if you have gluon, gluon, start a, glu a gluon, gluon pair, a hard glue, glue pair, starting to emit a soft gluon, you'd have exactly the same thing with essentially a factor CA instead of a factor CF here. All right. Uh, this is also extremely interesting in the large NC limit of QCD, because in the large NC limit of QCD, CF is essentially NC over 2, CA is NC, and so you can just replace a gluon by two quark-antiquark -quark pairs. And again, this type of expressions allows you to get uh, much easier control about, about uh, over multiple soft gluon emissions, okay? Uh, 
So this is something that we derived in the context of E plus E minus going to QQ bar gluon, but this is generic. Whenever you have two hard quark with momenta K1 and K2, emitting a soft gluon from them is going to come with such a factor. Okay, let me finish here. So we've handled the soft case. The last one I'd like to discuss is the, well, if it's not soft, it's collinear. Uh, and again, the, the idea is exactly the same, showing you that if you go to the collinear case, you also do have simplifications. And so this is, Again, a fairly simple manipulation. I'm, I'm going to start from d sigma, d2 sigma dx1, dx2 there. So you have a function of x1 and x2, and instead of writing it as a function of x1 and x2, I'm going to write it as a function of z, which is x3, and t, well, either t, which is 1 minus cosine theta 1, 3, so assume here that, that K3 is collinear to K1. I need to pick either K1 or K2, pick, pick whichever you want. Uh, so assume that K3 is collinear with K1. And so I'm going here to take T, which is 1 minus cosine theta 1, 3. Uh, you, you can work directly with theta 1, 3 if you wish. It's just, again, it's, it's a bit easier to work with... Uh, one minus cos rather than, than angles directly. This is a trivial change of variable, okay? So I have two variables. I'm redefining two variables based on my first choice of variables. Uh, x3 is two minus x1 minus x2. Uh, one minus cos theta one three, I can write it using the expression up there. So I can, again, write it down as one minus x2, two times one minus x2 divided by x1, two minus x1 minus x2. So it should change a variable from x1, x2 to some functions of x1, x2, all right? If you do that, at the end of the day, you do get an awful expression, because this is certainly not the uh, appropriate set of variables to discuss this. At the end of the day, what you do get is d sigma, so d to sigma uh, dz dt, is some horrendous function. There's an EQ squared NC sigma zero, no big surprise here, alpha CF over to pi times four one plus one minus Z squared. Uh, I'm not insisting on this one, all right? Uh, the next line is actually going to be the important one. Four Z two minus Z T. Again, I'm just giving you this in case you want to redo the exercise by yourself. Uh, it's really not a complicated exercise. It's, as I said, it's, it's genuinely a uh, change of variable that you should probably have, would probably have been able to do yourself 10 years ago. Uh, yeah, that's it. Again, I just don't give a damn about that expression. The, the expression I'm interested in is the case where K3 is collinear with K1, and what happens when K3 becomes collinear to K1? T is small. So in the limit where T is small, this is just going to give you something like, so you get something like EQ squared NC sigma zero, uh, alpha s over 2 pi times uh, 1 over t coming from here times cf 1. So this can be neglected. This can be neglected. Uh, and you get 1 plus 1 minus z squared over, so again, t can be neglected here, t can be neglected there, this constant four that cancel the four here, and so I'm just left with this. If anyone here has already done QCD calculations in the past or had QCD lectures, they might recognize some 
fundamental object in QCD. So first, are you surprised to see this? I hope you're not. Uh, we started yesterday, essentially, at some point saying QCD is a Kriniar divergence. This is just the Kriniar divergence. If you integrate over T, you're going to get infinite unless you regularize it. And essentially, if you start regularizing the T integration, instead of going to zero, you put a cut somewhere, you're going to get a log, which is exactly a collinear algorithm, again. Uh, the interesting part, again, the one over Z here, is it surprising? Not at all. It's, again, a soft divergence. If you take Z to zero, it means your gluons becoming soft, and you have a soft divergence. The interesting part here is that if you look at, so again, there's now phase over 2 pi. It's, it's a first order QCD correction, no big, no big surprise. The interesting part here is that you have a T dependence on one hand, and you have a Z dependence on the other hand. So this is, again, something where, some case where things do factorize. You can actually view this as this is just the E plus E minus going to QQ bar, okay? And this thing there is just this, so this is one and this is two. This is just this one, which splits collinearly into a gluon of collinear momentum fraction Z and quark momentum fraction one minus Z of the original quark one. So this guy here, it's really a factorization. Maybe I should draw this uh, slightly differently. It really is a factorization between something like this and here, this quark splitting collinearly into a quark and a gluon, all right? And again, this is really a fundamental result of QCD. We're actually going to see that again tomorrow in deep in next six scattering. This function here, uh, CF times this function there here, is really, uh, it's really telling you if I start to split one object linearly, there's going to be one over theta squared, which is just a divergence. But then depending on the Z fraction, there's going to be a weight associated with each Z. And so this is something known as the Alterelli Parisi splitting function. And in this case, it's the P uh, Q G Q incarnation of this. So it tells you that if you have a collinear splitting, again, there's a factorization between the hard guy and the collinear splitting itself, and the collinear splitting as a function associated with it, which tells you how the Z fraction in that splitting is going to be uh, distributed. So this is all I wanted to say about E plus E minus collisions. Uh, I had a few notes somewhere about things not to forget to say. Uh, it's lost. No, alpha as I've said, and that's okay, so I think I've said all I wanted to say. Uh, Two things. First, I left here a sheet of paper with the uh, topics left for, uh, still left for decision. If anyone wants to hear, put a, check, put a tick mark there on the topic you want to hear. Uh, second, is there any question on what we said in E plus E minus collisions? Knowing that you can always come to my office later if uh, there's anything. No? Everything's crystal clear? then I think we've all deserved coffee. Thanks.